Come to your spinal tract. All right, let's get started. Welcome everyone to the third webinar of the APA New York Upstate Chapter 2020 Virtual Conference. This session is the University of Albany student presentation on their work with the town of Gilderland. My name is Marcia Keyes, and my colleague Rocky Ferraro and I will be your host for this session. We are particularly pleased to be able to host this session because as both members of the uh, conference planning committee and as adjunct faculty members, we've had an opportunity to get to know the students that you're going to see in a few moments. So we would like to let you all know that all sessions are being recorded and attendees will receive an email link to the recordings once they have been posted. Now all attendees are automatically muted but if you have any questions or comments, please submit them in the Q&A and Rocky and I will monitor your questions and the presenters will answer them at the end of the session. So our topic today comes from the University of Albany Studio class in the Masters of Regional Planning program. And this was conducted under the auspices of a adjunct faculty member, Kate Maynard, Maynard, who is, I believe, with us today. The students worked last spring with the town of Gilderland in Albany County in developing, developing a trails plan for the town. But as we all know, we were forced to shut down uh, last March in the middle of the pandemic. And so the students had to go fully online. So they were faced with how to complete a project where a critical aspect is input from the town and from its citizens. So this session today reproduces in part what they presented to the town at the end of last semester and they'll discuss some of the tools and techniques that they use to finalize their project under such trying and unusual conditions. So we have three speakers with us today and I'm going to introduce them now and then we will go to the speakers and they'll uh, continue on. So our first speaker today is Gregory Isoldi. Greg graduated in the spring of 2020, so congratulations, <laughs> with his MRP degree from UAlbany and now he's working as a GIS data analyst for Building Footprints USA, located in Albany. Greg received his undergraduate degree in urban studies and planning from the University at Albany. Now, Greg says he has a passion for autonomous vehicles and outlined in his master's paper how implementation of this new technology can be possible. So I think that sounds like another session. <laughs> Our second speaker is Nick Shuck. Nick also has his undergraduate degree in urban studies and planning from UAlbany. And he expects to graduate with his MRP degree in May of 2021. He's currently employed by Renewa Energy in Glens Falls. They specialize in solar development and interconnection of distributed generation systems. Now, Nick's main interest is the development of uh, community-based renewable energy systems. And while Nick uh, probably doesn't want me to say this, I'm going to add it in. I know Nick interrupted his studies at UAlbany when he was deployed to serve overseas. So we are thrilled to have Nick back in our master's program. And our third speaker is Adam Toby. Adam graduated from SUNY Oneonta with a degree in computer art, and he graduated in spring 2020 with his MRP degree from the University of Albany. So congratulations to Adam also. Now, Adam spent a six month term with AmeriCorps where he was physically building trails. And he tells me that that's what prompted him to join the MRP program. And I know that for a fact because he was in my, my parks and preservation class last semester, very good student. He already knew what I was teaching about. So Adam is currently working for the Albany Visualization and Informatics Lab at the University at Albany. And we're gonna be hearing more from that group a little bit later in our conference session um, when they talk about hazard mitigation planning on November 4th. So I'm going to now turn it over to the students and I believe Nick is going to share a screen and then Greg will be starting. So Nick, how are you doing there? Share your screen. Here it is. There you go. And take it away, folks. 
Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is staying safe and doing well under these circumstances. My name is Gregory Isoldi, and it is a pleasure to introduce the Trails and Open Space Project on behalf of the other studio team members today. This project was not completed by just Adam, Nick, and I. We had a great deal of help from the students listed, but unfortunately, they were unable to be present today. I would also like to thank, uh, take this time to thank our instructor, Kate Maynard, for providing her expertise throughout the planning process, as well as the Town of Gilderland members for their expertise on the subject matter. Next slide. The Town of Gilderland has partnered with the University at Albany Master of Regional Planning Program to begin advancements with the Trails and Open Space Project. This project consisted of developing and redeveloping multi-use trails that link residential neighborhoods together. This included the overall assessment of parks, open spaces, residential developments, and existing conditions of the town. Identifying potential local and regional connections that already exist was essential towards providing new proposed recommendations for the town. This planning process required several key assessments. The review of prior planning studies provided a holistic approach to the um, project engagement. It is important to understand how the historical sites can be incorporated into the overall trail system. This will allow crucial aspects within Gilderland's history to serve within the trail aesthetics, making history an important component to the everyday usage of these trails. Community engagement strategy helps students and planners analyze vital community information that may have been included in the research. The studio team held a public meeting to engage different groups within Gilderland to better understand what is required. The selected town designations were all within the town of Gilderland. Next slide. In order to plan for the future of Gilderland, it is crucial to consider the town's past and current characteristics. The community profile is important in the class's scope of work and was used as a starting point. It was a helpful way to gain an understanding of the geographical area, but more importantly, the wants and needs of the residents. The suburban town is rich in character and the ultimate goal was to enhance the vibrant and historic nature within the scope of work by improving connectivity between Gilderland's popular destination, as well as prioritizing multimodal transportation options. Next slide. In order to better understand Gilderland's progression over the years, the studio class reviewed previous planning efforts and studies dating back to 1987. In order to identify past practices and preferences, previous planning efforts act as a guideline for the studio scope of work. The town of Gilderland has been proactive in its planning efforts over the years, and we wanted to follow up on that. This was particularly helpful when considering the existing conditions analysis. These conditions were utilized as a starting point to examine the natural and built environment of designated sites. It was crucial for students to decipher between complete and incomplete recommendations from past plans and to analyze whether those are still applicable currently. Therefore, recommendations proposed by studio are built upon the foundation of past efforts while propelling the town's long-term objectives. Next slide. Community members are considered experts in their communities. Public meetings provide them with the opportunity to utilize that expertise in a subtle yet helpful way. Students presented on prior plans and then took questions and concerns for residents. At the public meeting held on March 2nd, 2020, before you know everything happened and everything was shut down, uh, there were hands-on activities for residents to participate in, providing interactive maps and anonymous comment cards to create a space for community members to leave honest comments and concerns. Studio members developed four hands-on activities to obtain community feedback. These were a Pathways Committee Plan recommendation map, an existing town of Gilderland map, and amenities checklist, as well as public comment cards. Next slide. Based on the comments from the community, the following recommendations were the most favorable. People wanted to see multi-use trails along Fuller Station Railbed, an off-road multi-use path between Route 155 and Knott Road, and the Albany Loop, a trail along Route 155 past Farnsworth Middle School. Next slide. This map and comment portion of the activity yielded the most results for community feedback. The map portion shows the key destinations for connectivity. Community members and stakeholders were encouraged to indicate on the map where they believe potential pathways would be useful in connecting parks to other parks, existing trails to parks, and whether bike lanes could be implemented. Using provided materials, the community was able to leave a number of comments directly on the map. Next slide. Okay, thank you, Greg. Um, so this is our 
overview of um, recommended uh, trail connections here. Uh, the recommended trail connections were obtained through the examination of sewer easements, the study of environmental issues and constraints, and community input and engagement. It was a collective effort by the community and planners to provide a trail best suited for local needs. Um, just going through this map right now, just to give you some bearing here, uh, we have out to the out to the uh, west, we have the village of Altamont and the Heldigberg Escarpment. Uh, to the south, we have Voorheesville. Uh, this area is known as the Pine, Albany Pine Bush area. Uh, here we have uh, Tower Santa Park uh, and the Western Turnpike Golf Course. And just so you know what these lines mean, um, these dashed purple lines are proposed multi-use trails, while these red ones here are, are already existing. And you can see uh, we'll get into this a little later, but you can see this green line here that will that represents the uh, future CDTC proposed trail. So we're going to go through some um, recommendations right now. We're not going to go through all of them, but we picked out a couple of them to show you guys what our ideas were. Uh, so this comes from the uh, recommendations for the Winter Rec area in Western Turnpike Golf Course area. Uh, here we can see the Winter Rec area. Uh, directly next to that is Tallis Center Park, which feeds into the Western Turnpike Golf Course. Uh, we had a main connection exist between Winter Rec area and Tallis Center Park, located right here with this red proposed trip, with this red already existing trail line. Uh, proposed connection to the golf course via the outdoor theater of Tallis Center Park and the north side of the park. So here we are proposing trails to the north side of the park here, and then we have the, um, the, the outdoor theater located at the southern end, which will connect uh, to the golf course itself. Um, exi existing trails, when they connect uh, Foundry Lane, Knot Road, Wanning Brook Lane, uh, we can find that here, uh, Wanning Brook Lane, Knot Road, and Foundry Road. Uh, and there's also this winding, this Wanning Brook Lane also feeds into the YMCA, which actually there's going to be new future development there. So this trail could serve a whole new community. Uh, historical sites, which you can see here in red, um, they will also be added to the trail system in Route 146, which is this line right here, will be altered to accommodate pedestrian traffic. Uh, DiCaprio Park. So here we have DiCaprio Park right here. Uh, it already has a main connection to the Albany Pine Bush area and the Volunteer Firefighters Memorial Park, which is here. Um, potential trail exists in the south of the park via the Hunger Kill River. Uh, Hunger Kill runs along this line right here, just to the south of, the, of DiCaprio Park, and also protected land to the south of the Pine Bush has opportunity to trail for trail implementation to connect Gilliland Elementary School to this whole area. So uh, just bring you back, unfortunately you can't see it here, but just bring you back to that Winding Brook Lane aspect. Um, that will also feed into from the YMCA up to the Gilliland Elementary School. And it would be it would be neat to see a potential trail link from the Pine Bush to that school. Uh, so we have a full connection from the southern end of the town up to the north. Recommendations for Knot Road Park. Uh, we decided to use a lot, utilize the tried and true planning uh, practice of capitalizing on the sewer right of way that is just northeast of Knot Road Park. Uh, we suggested that the right of way could allow for a multi use trail that would be in close proximity to the park and act as an intersection between the park and other trail networks. As recommended by the community, we suggested a loop trail that follows the perimeter of the park's parcel, which would connect both the multi use trail to the Capital District Transportation Committee or CDTC's proposed regional trail. And you can see this right here. This is not World Park. That is that loop that we are proposing. And you can see the CDTC's proposed trail running just to the south of it. Recommendations for Roger Keenholz Park. So the Roger Keenholz Park is in close proximity to the Water Valley Reservoir, which you can see here. Uh, park is here with the Water Valley Reservoir just to the north of it. Um, it's close proximity to the reservoir just north of it. Uh, these two community assets are connected by a currently out of use bridge that we suggest be converted to a pedestrian walkway as a means of connecting the two. The town owns and utilizes the large parcel directly to the east of the park, which is here. As a small landfill, so over time, over 
so our team determined that this would this could be an opportunity to use a path to use a path that would cross along the property as an interpretive trail to learn about waste processing or renewable energy if the parcel could be used for community solar. And we also could make useful connections to Tallis Central Park and Gilliland High School. We can see the high school here in blue, and we can go down Route 146 again, and we can go right to uh, Tallis Central Park here. Historical sites. Um, after discussions with the town officials, it was concluded that the involvement of historical sites with trail implementation would be useful. Uh, the town has a strong role in an industrial past that can be conveyed to the residents and visitors using the trail system. Not only will trails amplify the importance of, of these sites, but they will also add an educational component and a sense of identity for the town and its residents. Um, we focus, there, there, are, there are quite a few historical sites in the town of Greenland, so but we decided to focus on four. Uh, we have the Battle of Norman Scale, which is uh, located uh, right across the street from the Winter Rec area. I have a map after this um, slide to show everyone exactly where each site is. Um, they're located right across the street from the Winter Rec area. Uh, this was a battle fought during the American Revolution. Um, the Far River Everett Banker, which is right down the road on Route 146, it housed the third mayor of Albany. Uh, the Vale of Tawasenta, which is also located on Route 40, 146, right next to the farm. It was, it's actually a uh, Native American burial ground. And you have the Albany Glassworks on uh, Foundry Road. Um, Albany, the, the Glassworks is considered to be one of the first, if not the first glassworks in the United States. And this is mainly due to the fact that the Albany Pine Bush is just to the north of it. And if anybody knows anything about the Pine Bush is that it is, um, it has sand, which is optimal for creating glass. Um, uh, then we can we want to uh, retrofit Route 146 to support bicyclists and hikers. Uh, this will allow these sites to be connected and walkable for residents. And just to give you a quick overview, uh, we can see here um, this this red dot here. Uh, that would be the the Talus, That would be the Battle of Norman Scale. Um, as we move down, we'll have the uh, Vale Talus Center. As we move down a little further, uh, that is the farm of Everett Banker. And then we cross the golf course all the way over to Foundry Road and we can see the glassworks and you can see the relation between the Albany pine bush and the glassworks, which is why it was such a, uh, uh, a useful business. Thank you, Nick. So as Greg had mentioned, we were extraordinarily fortunate to get one open house meeting prior to the COVID-19 shutdown. So we made a list of all the amenities surrounding trails and parks and put those into a, a large poster board. We presented every member of the public with stickers to mark all of their preferred amenities and using the public comments on trail amenities, several recommendations could be made. There was almost equal interest in developing trails for hiking as well as biking. So a paved multi-use path would be the most cost effective implementation for the town. Since loop trails were preferred over out and back trails, when appropriate, we recommended that loop options should be prioritized. The community also identified seating areas, restrooms, and trash receptacles as being the most important amenities. Finally, it was recommended that the town increase and develop their wayfinding and branding for their parks and trails. Next slide, please. So wayfinding is the system that provides guidance, typically using signage to ensure that trail users are comfortable knowing where to go. Since I had a background in computer art, our team allowed me to take on this project of designing and drafting a wayfinding option for our trails plan. What you're looking at is six different types of signs that were identified to assist user navigation. From left to right, we have decision signs that should be placed in locations where user users have multiple trail options and need to decide which trail to take. Affirmation signs reassure the user that they're on the correct path. These signs should be placed in locations where there may be a brief interruption of the trail, like an intersecting road. Uh, we have map kiosks, which are regional maps that show how multiple trail systems interconnect. And then map panels depict specific trails and their amenities. These should be placed at the beginning of trails. Way markers are the small circular signs, and you can see I tried to magnify that a little bit so you folks could actually read that. 
uh, that are typically nailed to trees. They provide continuous affirmations for the users that are on, on the intended path. It was recommended that the town develop and implement a consistent sign design theme using these categories to create a sense of continuity between all of their, um, all their parks and trails. The last sign you can see is inf informative. That would be uh, signs that are discussing any environmental or historical uh, sites of interest. So in the example that I drafted on this slide, you'll notice a notch in the top right of, of these otherwise rectangular signs, and for the most part. Um, this is a caricature of the Helderberg Escarpment, which is a locally uh, recognizable natural feature as a theme to weave these different signs together. Next slide, please. So what you're looking at here in the background is the Helderberg, Helderberg Escarpment for anyone that's not familiar with our region. These are 1,100 foot high, strikingly beautiful limestone cliffs that overlook the capital region. In the foreground are the map kiosk and the map panel styles of designs that are signs we designed. And the one on the right, I included some of my original annotations to the town that included ways you could incorporate Braille for accessibility um, and other, uh, other, other changes that could be made to these signs. So these were originally intended to have a district name available where you can see in blue, um, these, these district spaces, we recommended that they color code different districts. So visitors could easily identify which district they were in, even at a quick glance. If they were riding by, riding by quickly on a bicycle, they would know exactly what district they were in just by color coding. Next slide, please. Then we decided to take a look at branding. Using repetitive slogans, logos, and wayfinding creates an identity that can be associated with the town's trails and parks. The town has previously began building their branding by using the phrase, Hike Gilderland. So we recommended that the town continue to use the phrase as, as a way to maintain that consistency. It was recommended that they develop a recognizable logo that can be quickly associated with its trail systems using symbols commonly associated with the outdoors like trees, mountains, or the sun. So after drafting many different examples that you can see in the top right, uh, we, we presented this to the director of the parks department and he suggested that we focus on a design that was circular with a large G to represent Gilderland, as that type of design was already established with the Gilderland School District. So the four examples on the bottom were just developed to give the town inspiration should they choose to pursue that. And I'll go ahead and turn this back over to Nick. Okay, um, and that takes us to funding. Um, obviously, uh, the town definitely has more role to play in the funding aspect than we do, but we still uh, looked at it. Uh, the town could explore using municipal allocations as a funding mechanism for their projects. This could include having a dedicated tax stream, budget allocations, or dedicating portions of existing revenue or increasing fees for town services. The consolidated Consolidated funding application would be submitted for various state operating grants dedicated to the improvement of uh, planning of trails and re recreation in municipalities. There are also state operated uh, federal funds, federal grants that the town could apply for by working with partners at the county level to increase accessibility traits for neighboring towns and cities. Uh, and funding, a lot of, uh, we had some stakeholders that also helped us out when it came to funding, um, especially one that comes to mind for me is the Hudson River Valley Greenway. They gave us great information on what grants are available and what can really be done to uh, interconnect uh, Gilliland trails, not, not only with just other town trails, but also with um, state trails as well. And uh, we all know that um, the, the pandemic hit New York in about mid-March, so obviously there were some serious challenges to be faced uh, with our project. Um, the challenges consist of, uh, we had learning how to navigate a natural naturally cooperative and collaborative process with new social distancing requirements, effectively presenting our research findings and suggestions to the public in an accessible and open manner without hosting large groups, in which we will uh, get into next slide, uh, pivoting halfway through to digitize every aspect of the planning process, and establishing reliable communication between ourselves and our project. 
So obviously we, uh, we went from working in the school and out in the field to working from home. Um, we, of course, what everybody does now, we held our weekly Zoom meetings, not only with the class, but with the town as well. Um, you know, it was extremely important. We, we, we just needed all to be on the same page. And, you know, sometimes we had to meet more than once out of class time, just because I think we all know it's probably some things are, are, are easy over the internet, but other things aren't. So um, we had to take that into account. Um, we had to create project teams based off the outline for the final document. And what we did here is we paired up into teams and work was done fully remote. Um, like for example, Adam and I did the historic section and the um, wayfinding section together. Uh, you know, we, we did all this without ever, you know, coming into contact with each other. I mean, I think if, well, I don't think I'm mistaken when I say this, I'm pretty sure after the pandemic hit, everybody in our class never saw each other face to face again. So, I mean, that was definitely a challenge. And I think our biggest challenge was um, what I said, what the challenge that we said before was, you know, conveying this information to the town to, to show them a final, pro uh, final product. So our class had to record uh, a presentation. You know, about four or five of us uh, recorded individually, uh, sent it to the other person, the other person recorded their spot and then it was all edited together. Uh, we, I, I, I think along with Adam and Greg uh, also believe that this was probably the most challenging part of, of the process for us. Um, not only this had to get this, we had about, you know, three to five days to do this. And it also uh, unfortunately happened during the same week that oral, oral presentations were due for um, everyone's grads papers. So it, it, it got a little stressful there. Um, things hit the fan real fast and we had to get it out, but it, it ended up working out really well. Um, and that should be posted to the um, town website soon for, um, for residents to view. Uh, with that, um, it, it, here we just, I just we wanted just to show you, these are some photos from our first town meeting. Um, you can see Greg, Shannon, there's Adam, uh, that's Nate, Erica, Henry, myself, uh, and there's our instructor, uh, Kate Maynard. And um, that, that concludes our presentation. Uh, before we answer any questions you may have, I just wanted to thank again, Adam and Greg for doing this with me. Um, all the students, Sh both Shannons, Erica, Hannah, Gregory, Henry, Nathan, and Adam again. Um, and also the town Gilman members, um, Peter Barber, superintendent, CJ Gallup, he runs the parks department. Ken is the uh, planner and Zainab. Um, she did all of our, uh, a lot of our map work for us. And so we can't thank them enough. And especially thanks to our instructor, uh, Kate Maynard. Um, probably without her, you know, this would have been extremely difficult, if not impossible. So she, she did a great job. And um, thank you guys for uh, listening to us. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, gentlemen, Nick and Adam and Greg. Um, very interesting presentation, a lot of great maps. And uh, Zainab, by the way, is also a alumni of the MRP program. So it's nice to see that uh, people graduate and go out and get real jobs and do really good work. Um, well, we have a question here in the Q&A. Um, Rocky, have you had a chance to read that yet and talk about it? Um, quite lengthy. Okay, um, yes, uh, the, the, the question basically is that, um, that because of, in terms of providing safe access to local attractions uh, for, for cycling tourists and, and what have you, and uh, while trails are a great recreational resource, uh, they can be isolated from the non-recreational destinations. So um, the emphasis seems to be on uh, making the connections and expanding recreational trails. Um, but there's some concern about the need for utilitarian everyday use of trails uh, by, by bike users or what have you. So are there any thoughts on how to balance uh, these two focus areas uh, between just focusing on the recreational versus destinations, if you will, um, that apply on more daily basis to the users? So I'll, I'll start us off on this one. Um, one of the things that we tried to do was to put together a list of 
as, as you would say in this, utilitarian destinations. And as we map those destinations, and that includes things like bus stops, uh, shopping plazas, um, any, any places of work that we thought would be uh, useful commuting lines, we tried to use those as um, kind of interconnected nodes that we could see if there was a way to weave our trails to interconnect these because you know we agree that there is sometimes too much of an emphasis and overemphasis on those recreational trails and that I know that in the Gilderland and even in the in the colony area especially we had uh, several people mention to us that they 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 really wish the bicycle trails uh, were more, as you say, utilitarian. So we did try to incorporate that in our structure. Nick or Greg, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? Um, no, I think I think you, you you said it quite well. I mean, I definitely would agree. We we not only focus on the recreational aspect, but uh, definitely when it came to trying to interconnect Western Avenue as well into that into the project, you know. Um, we looked at crosswalks, any any type of crossing that we could we could really broaden that that connection with. Sorry, last thing to add on that would be probably uh, people are really focused, especially at the town meeting, on the safety of their town, um, especially with these trails and the sidewalks and anything that we were going to be working on. Um, so definitely on like the utility trails rather than the recreational trails there definitely be a large emphasis on making sure those trails are, uh, you know, especially for bike lanes, flat, smooth, and uh, revamped if they're already existing and definitely working on those new ones. I, I have a question uh, to ask, you know, you, you uh, in your um, recommendations, you talked about um, um, the financial opportunities that may be presented to, that may be available from the local to uh, grant opportunities at the state and federal level. <clears throat> what about from the regulatory perspective uh, in terms of site plan review uh, activities? Was there any discussion about that with the town of Gilderland that as they review site-specific uh, site projects that there be provisions made as a condition of approval to require either an easement or actually put the trail connection uh, along their property or through their property in order to tie into your recommendations that are uh, that are part of the overall trail system plan. Yeah, I can, I can answer this one. So actually for most of the recommended trails that we had, the ownership was to the town of Gilderland. Uh, I went through where our recommendations were and checked the parcel ownership uh, to see who owned it, if someone would have to be contacted, you know, if it was owned by New York State or, uh, but for the most part, I would say about 80% of the parcels were actually owned by the town or the state. And then another portion of that was over sewer easements. So definitely we did have to invest and look into if those easements were gonna be compromised. And uh, that's what Nathan Sieper focused on was where were those easements? Uh, you know, when were those created and how can we get onto those if we're going to have to? But most of that was dedicated and um, it was more provisional and sent to the town. Uh, for them to determine what they would want to do with those. Thank you. Okay. We do have another question in the Q&A box. So let me just go ahead and read that from Robert. Uh, any idea which elements of the report will be advanced by the town first? I, 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 I'm going to be honest, I'm not exactly sure yet. I know they've been in a couple different directions. Um, I personally hope that they really go for and advancing this the wayfinding that Adam did. I, I thought out of every, out of a lot of things in this project, I thought that was so creative and so well thought out. And also it, it would it would save them quite a bit of money going going to a uh, going to another designer. I mean, they just got some great, great work done by a student right down the road. So I personally hope they, they, they start spearheading that when they can. Um, uh, another one I, I would probably think is what they're looking at is uh, really making connections to Tower Central Park. I think that's a big one for them as well. So just to add on, Nick, uh, thank you very much for that, for that wonderful praise. Um, 
I, I this is completely speculation, but I think that the a, a lot of the the work here has kind of been tabled due to COVID. I think that um, building trails is probably not at the forefront of the town's minds right now. Uh, but I, I do recall them having a lot of interest in developing the trail around the uh, Waterfleet Reservoir. And I, that's something that I personally would, would be hoping and looking forward to as being one of the sooner projects that gets implemented. Um, does, it, does the town have a, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> a trails committee or an advisory committee uh, in place that would provide um, guidance as it relates to <clears throat> implementation associated with the plan uh, to the various, uh, you know, the, the town board uh, and, and other entities that would be responsible for implementation? Um, I, 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 Greg or Adam could correct me if I'm wrong here, but I, I don't specifically recall meeting with a uh, trails committee. Um, I feel this, this project seemed like it was really, um, really being pushed forward by, by Ken, CJ, and, and, and Peter. Um, it seemed like there was something that they've been wanting to do for a long time, and uh, they just they they want to that they, they seem like they're the, really interested in getting it off the ground. Yeah, this is this is definitely an initiative that gener that was generated from the town. Uh, I will say that while it's not an official committee, trails committee uh, or commission or anything, there is I, I believe they do have a a good working uh, relationship with the Albany Pine Bush Commission, DEC, and the Mohawk Hudson Land Conservancy as far as developing some of these and making these trail recommendations a reality. Thank you. If anyone has any more questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll take a few more minutes uh, to you can type up your question and we'll look for those. Um, I had a question for you folks. Um, you mentioned the Albany Pine Bush. Uh, I think it was Nick who, who talked about that. Did you have any connection or communication with those folks? Um, and would you, if you didn't, would you have if you hadn't been thrust into a pandemic? Um, I, I know that the Albany Pine Bush area was Erica Corsi's um, area of focus. Um, I, I, off the top of my head, I can't remember if she had, I know she tried contact, con getting co into contact with them. I'm not sure if she was able to succeed or not. Um, but from, from what I gather, the Albany Pine Bush seems like they're, they're, um, they're easy to work with. Uh, they, they're, they're all, they're all about, I, I remember um, Ken and Peter specifically telling me one time about how, you know, the, the, the Pine Bush has always been cooperative with them in developing new trails. So I, I, I think uh, there's definitely a good relationship there already. Mm. Yes, I'm pretty sure you're, I'm pretty sure you're right on that. Uh, Chris Hopper and the executive director uh, and those folks, they, they know what they're doing and they've been uh, working with the town and the city of Albany uh, for, for years. So um, I know that they have quite a trail system there and I wondered if you had thought about making any more connections than they are already there. Um, well, there, there was, uh, right um, when I was talking about that Winding Brook Road um, okay. trail network, um, they, and that goes right to, Winding Brook Road feeds right into Western Avenue and right across the street from there is Gilliland Elementary School. And Actually, right next door to Gillen Elementary School is um, actually I should say right behind uh, the Pine Bush land, but it's right up against that that Gilderland Elementary School property. So we we wanted to uh, find out if the Pine Bush land was uh, will would want to maybe create a, tra a trail connecting the Pine Bush through el the elementary school to Winding Brook Road. Um, we think that would have been a great idea, uh, especially for the students that that go to the school, they could, they have trail accessibility right in their backyard. Um, I, I do, I do remember uh, there were some, were some issues there because I, I do know that those are DC wetlands back there. So that, that could um, definitely pose some issues. And also um, the, uh, the Gilliland School District is, is a little touchy on this, um, but hopefully they'll come around it and then the town and the school and the pine bush can make something happen. Cause I think it, I think it would work out really well. 
That, that's great. There's definitely connections through school, particularly in elementary school. Yeah. Um, I, I did have one other question for you. You were very all polite in how you addressed the issues you had to face during the onslaught of this, this virus and being forced to go remote over the spring break and never seeing each other again. What do you really feel? I mean, I obviously, I think I speak for a lot of people and they say, I much rather prefer to be in person. Um, yeah, it was definitely frustrating at times. Don't get me wrong. I mean, especially when that, when it was getting right down to the deadline and, you know, you know, the town wanted changes, we wanted some changes and some of those changes didn't really match up together. And it was definitely, definitely a little, definitely got a little annoying at the, at the end there, especially when we had to do the, um, the uh, recorded presentation. Cause I mean, I didn't, honestly, I'm not the most tech savvy person. I didn't even know you could do that at that time. So, I mean, but it turned out great. And also, you know, it, it also hit at the same time that I didn't have to do it, but everybody else in our class had to do the oral presentations for, for their papers too. So, I mean, that just, that, that really took everybody out, out of the loop there. So, um, I mean, it was frustrating at times, certainly, but I think we handled it very well. And I, I really think we did, we did probably the best we definitely could have. I mean, I, I think we did a great job for, you know, regarding the circumstances. Just want to give a, a counter opinion to uh, to Nick's. I'm actually I appreciate the quarantine situation that we had. Um, I I think that it really thrust everybody into 2020, whether or not they wanted to be technologically. So folks that didn't have an email before have no choice now but to be communicating digitally. And I think that's really started pushing projects forward faster. Um, so I I've actually seen in other work that that you might hear a little bit about if you attend the November 4th webinar. Uh, that's actually been a source of success for some of my work. That's yeah. an interesting perspective and gr great plug on November 4th where Adam's also gonna be speaking to us again in that webinar, but uh, Greg, what about you? Um, you know, I'll put myself kind of in the middle. You know, it's definitely a great thing that people are working from home and people are quarantining and doing what they gotta do. They're doing their part. Um, and you're right, we're now in the 20, you know, 21st century. This, I've always been saying for my job that I do, like, I could be doing this from home, you know, I'm a full-time student, sometimes going into work is hard, and then coming home late at night. So then it kind of just happened. And, you know, here I am, six, seven months later, still working from home. And you know, that's how it is. But it was definitely frustrating. I'm, I can call myself a people person, and I miss seeing my friends, I miss seeing my professors. And it, it was a weird interaction. Um, but I think you can really only have one outlook. You have to stay positive. And the only way you can be positive is just act like you're not in quarantine. You know, obviously stay home, wear a mask, do what you got to do. But, you know, even just like for this conference right now, I would love to be presenting in front of people, but it's not something we can do right now. So this is the best we have. And you know what? I think it went well. And I, you know, I'm glad people came and that's it. That, you know, that was great. So just got to be happy with what we have for now. If I can have a follow-up question about, um, you know, the stakeholder uh, outreach, uh, stakeholder input and outreach uh, that you did uh, in the early part of the projects, as you noted, you had some meetings, in-person meetings to, to get their feedback and post-its on, on the board and what have you. Uh, then we ran into the shutdown uh, situation, so we had to go remotely. Um, because of that, the feedback to, from, from the stakeholders and the outreach in terms of the recommendations, how how you anticipate that to be moving forward relative to the town's responsibility, uh, since obviously you guys were not able to, to achieve that objective, but do you see some more aggressive outreach by the town moving forward relative to the recommendation that come out of here based on stakeholder feedback and input? Um, I, I, I certainly hope so. I mean, for me, I, I hope they do more outreach. Uh, as I, I did mention before, uh, especially outreach to the Hudson River, River Valley Greenway. Um, because what they're, what the, their, their trail, what they're trying to do with trail implementation right now is exactly what that organization is there for. I mean, they, they, they have 
the 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 right grant opportunities and the the more the more you apply to them and, and the better the grants are the, the 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 grant writing I should say the likelihood that they will approve you and also you you'll have more opportunities to get in on you know M the Empire State Trail and um, other and Mohawk Conservancy and other things like that so for me I could the I think the most valuable stakeholder for me that I interacted with was definitely the Hudson Valley. Us in River Valley Greenway, which I, I hope that the the, um, the town explores further because they're, they're definitely a lot of help. Just sort of a follow up question that's being raised in the Q and A, um, uh, and I think Gre uh, Greg uh, responding to this question uh, responds to this question. Uh, uh, do you think you got more community feedback doing it remotely, remotely digitally as opposed to having in person? So, Greg, uh, say, respond to that. Yeah, so from the community uh, meeting on March 2nd, uh, there was a really large showing. I would say there's probably around 30 to 40 people, maybe even more, honestly, that came in and out. Uh, and we got some really great feedback. However, we're still waiting for our plans and this presentation to be posted for the town. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't believe there's been any feedback uh, digitally or remotely because there hasn't been the opportunity. Um, but judging off of the people that were at the meeting originally, I would expect a decent turnout uh, for the digital output of feedback as well. But uh, for now, unfortunately, we don't have uh, any remote feedback yet. So I would like to just add to that. I What I'm anticipating for the digital versus um, in-person feedback, as opposed to as opposed to the in-person, I think the in-person feedback is definitely more qualitative where the digital feedback is going to be quantitative. You're going to get the answers digitally of exactly what you're asking and it's only going to be as good as the questions we ask. Um, whereas in person, we can have a discussion with somebody, they're going to have their own opinion, their own personality, and that discussion can evolve into different um, different questions that we might have not known to ask. So I think there's going to be a limitation in what we get back for, for digital feedback. I don't think it's going to, to severely impact uh, the implementation of the project, but I think we're going to miss out on a lot of really good stories and uh, tidbits of information that, that folks will tell us that are local from the area. Good, thank you. Marsha, you're, Marcia, you're muted. You, you're muted. Yes, I am muted. I always uh, do that. Uh, we do have one other comment here. Uh, back to when Nick was speaking about the Hudson River Valley Greenway, I see the executive director has chimed in here. And he seconds your uh, opinion of the Hudson River Valley Greenway. That's Mark, as many of you may know, Marcus Diglione, who's also chapter president. So any last comments from any of you folks? Oh, so we have a question. Oh, I have another question from Carrie. Uh, for those of you still in the area, do you plan to stay tuned to the outcome of your work? or given the opportunity to go back to the town and maybe host a public meeting in person? Uh, uh, yeah. okay. All right, Nick, you can go. Uh, um, I mean, I, uh, I'll at least be here until next, next May. So, I mean, I, if, if something happens by then, that, that would be neat. Um, I will say it's definitely, uh, I'm the only one in this class who did not graduate last semester after we conclude this project. So it, it is kind of difficult getting a hold of these people now besides Adam and, and Greg here, obviously. But um, I mean, that would be great. That'd be a good opportunity. Um, we just really wait and see now, see what, what direction the town wants to go in. Yeah, I think it would be, it would be great to, you know, I'd ha be happy to do this public meeting again. Honestly, the turnout was so great. It was almost like inspiring to see the community and just everyone there that, you know, we started this project from the beginning. I'd like to see it through to the end. And if that opportunity presents itself, then great. And if it doesn't, you know, maybe it's later in the future. That's okay too. Uh, they still have my email, so. 
and I can say that I am heavily invested and, and rooted in the capital region. So it would be wonderful to see these trails come to fruition. I'm absolutely secretly house hunting right now. So it would be wonderful to be near a, a well-designed trail system. <laughs> Well, we have you all on record. We have you all on record now saying you're willing to come back. So <laughs> now you're going to speak stock. And Kate's listening too, Kate Maynard. So she may be on the on the on the horn too. Um, so it is tough being a one semester project. I can say having taught studios that the students come, students go, and they do the work, and they're off to the the big uh, world out there. So the fact that uh, you folks are still in the area, all all three of you, um, it's. Uh, something that it's nice to see that you're actually all employed, gainfully employed during these tough times is even uh, more heartening for those of us to, to see. So we applaud you all on that. Um, Rocky, are there any last questions that you yeah. see? There, there is a question here. Um, what was the most challenging part of working with the public? <laughs> Honest confession. Uh, <laughs> Actually, Should I stop was, the recording? Maybe I'll stop the recording now. Good idea. <laughs> Honestly, for the most part, it was, it was really, it went really well, I thought. I thought the, the only part that, at least for me, when I was a deer, I was definitely a deer car in headlights at this moment. I was presenting at the first town meeting and um, a woman there asked a question that really didn't have too much to do with the scope of work we had or what we were presenting. And, and I, I remember Kate, Maynard, our professor, was sitting like in the second or third row, and this lady asked me this question, and I kind of like, I'm like, what? And I look over at Kate, and she stares at me. She stands up immediately and starts talking. <laughs> so that was probably for me was the only the, uh, the the one part for me that that was that got that caught me off guard. But other than that, I, I thought the engagement with the community was. I think it went. I think that community meeting went ten times better than any of us could have ever hoped for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think for as a planner confession, um, it was really just answering questions that I had no expertise on. It was really about the town of Gilderland and um, New Carner Road and how to improve the safety on that. And unfortunately, that wasn't really in our scope of work. And it was really towards the town uh, because the town had more knowledge of a project that was going on. So we kind of had to have the um, uh, town planner just come in and step in for a second to answer a couple questions. Um, but overall, the community was amazing and they loved uh, giving input and we loved hearing it. Yeah, just to echo some of these same sentiments that uh, Nick and Greg are mentioning, I, you know, I think the, the planning field is very uh, nuanced at times with, with uh, what exactly these meetings are about and what they're supposed to be about and we go in with a plan and I think the public sees it more or less as this is another public venue and so I, ha I have an opportunity here to explain or question um, you know something that's been bothering me about the town and while this meeting was that while our public meeting was specifically intended to be for trails you know we would absolutely find ourselves on tangents that would have to be answered by other members of the town and i think that's you know that's just the public not not understanding the nuance of of specific planning uh meetings i think Well, as planners, we all are taught, you know, you, you know what you know, you know what you don't know. And when you don't know the answers, you know where to go to find them. Planners are often brokers of information transference. And so you have to always know when to go get someone else to help answer the question. Um, that's a lot of what we do and we should do. So applause to you for knowing that and kicking it back to the town uh, because you had a very focused uh, scope of work and as you say, people come to a town meeting and they don't know necessarily how that happens. So yes, oftentimes questions come out of left field. And uh, I would like to add here that uh, Kate Maynard has chimed in a couple times saying she's very proud of you guys. Glad to hear you're still in the area. And uh, I wish I could unmute her, but we're not able to do that in this session. But uh, very, very happy that you all are here and uh, finishing up a long, project that's now much longer than what you probably ever envisioned. So 
persistence is one of those qualities that is uh, always recognized in good planning. So I don't see any more Q&A. Rocky, do you see any more Q&A? No. No? Okay. So it's just about one o'clock. I think we'll wrap up then. Thank you to Greg and to Nick and to Adam for uh, your good presentation. It's always heartwarming to see good work coming from our students in the master's program at UAlbany. So thank you to all the attendees who have joined us today. Um, we will be uh, putting these recordings up on the chapter's YouTube uh, account, and that will be coming in the future. It won't be ready just for now, but it will be coming up in the future. And I'd also like to just remind you that tomorrow, our next session is at 3 p.m., when we will hear about the creation and development of the Harriet Tubman National Historic Park in Auburn, New York. And then of course we have two sessions per week uh, through November through to November 19th. So if you haven't yet registered for those, please, please do so. Um, there are no CM credits for this session. We just did get a last question on that. We have not assigned CM credits for the student sessions, but there are CM credits for all of the rest of the sessions that are uh, available uh, on the website in terms of how many, how many credits are assigned to each session. Okay, any last comments, questions? I think that's our last question. So thank you once again, folks. Thank you to Rocky Ferraro for being a co-host and I will see you tomorrow when I'm hosting the Harriet Tubman session. So please join us then tomorrow at three o'clock. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Great, great Thank job, you. students, with your presentation. You're great representatives of the University at Albany Planning and Geography Department. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Definitely. Take care, Thank everyone. You. Stay safe. Bye. -bye. Bye.